to this morning session. Our next speaker is from the healthcare space, Dr. Shabir Nelikod, a trained neurologist. Dr. Nelikod is the founder, MD of the super specialty Universal Hospital in Abu Dhabi, which he founded in 2013, which is today among the leading healthcare providers in the United Arab Emirates. He has expanded the hospital to include medical clinics, successful health campaigns, and IT services to provide comprehensive healthcare services. The hospital has been at the forefront of introducing new technology. For instance, it introduced the first robotic pharmacist in the Gulf region. The system has helped cut out errors, improved the dispensing time, and freed the hospital's human pharmacists to interact with patients. He is known for providing charity healthcare in the GCC and in India, with a view to provide for the community, especially the underprivileged, and financially supporting educational institutes for old age homes. Dr. Nellicode holds an MBBS from KMC Manipal, an MD from Sri Ramchandra Medical College, Chennai, and a DCN from the Institute of Neurology, London. Today, Dr. Nellicode will talk to us about his journey and how we can apply those learnings to the Indian healthcare space. Let's have a warm ISB welcome for Dr. Shabir Nellicode. I've taken prior permission from my previous speaker to talk about something after having a lot of Pepsi and traveling in a Tata car. We are late on time, so I think I'll, I'll effectively utilize my time to speak about what I want to speak today. And I hope uh, your brains have sufficient storage to take what I'm going to talk now. So, I mean, my topic was... Uh, you know, something very, very uh, different for me than what I expected. What victor and what spoils? So, guys, I am not a business expert. I'm just a clinician. I'm a doctor and I see patients. And what I do is I lead a team of clinicians and I do my work using a team of clinicians. And my only objective is to give evidence-based clinical results. If I don't deliver this, the rest of the story is just not good for me. So I think if you all want to call it as a gamble, I could, I could agree to that. We could use that phrase. Because what is happening now is that there is a lot of, uh, we bear a lot of market forces and we have regulatory pressures. So I come from a different environment. I mean, uh, about 15 years ago, I left to the UK, I mean, uh, was fortunate to get a scholarship and then work in England. To get trained in the best of neurology, I'm a movement disorder specialist, so I would want to talk about it, but that's not the platform to talk about what I do. So we bear a lot of regulatory pressures. I mean, back in India, now you have a Medical Council of India which regulates a lot of hospitals on what needs to be done, what, not, what should not be done. So we come from a very tough regulatory pressure-oriented uh, government which has got an arm called as the health authority which tells you what to do and what not to do and I come from a hundred percent insurance market and that would be your core interest in my discussion today how it's going to function and how it's going to make an impact to the Indian uh, market scenario so we face a lot of uh, problems in the third party payments and I am always at risk I mean I carry a lot of risk medical legally if I don't do a surgery all what I built on it's, 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 it's all going to go waste. And finally, I would want to put it as a, 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 a debatable thing is I am on a commoditized market. I think I am in the same league as uh, a retail product or a commercial vehicle. So I would also want to be branded as a commoditized industry. Now, I'm not here to talk about a lot of people whom I, uh, whom I respect. I mean, especially this is one man whom I want you all to know, who have done exemplary uh, work in the field of healthcare. Can anybody guess this guy's name? No, it's okay, you don't need to know it. I mean, uh, this is a man whom I really respect. And I would want him to be talking to the Indian government on bringing in some amount of exemplary values to the healthcare stream. Now, this is James Orbinski. He's one of the practicing doctor who had been awarded a Nobel Prize in 1999 for doing humanitarian services to the mankind. Uh, what James was saying is that what I've experienced is that I can't know the future. 
I can't know if anything that I do will change what happens tomorrow. I can't know with certainty, but what I do know is if I do nothing, nothing will change. So that's a great statement that, uh, I mean, everybody could take home. Uh, what I'm impressed is that if you look at uh, his uh, programs around the world, I mean, you know, no organization in the world runs an effective medical program like this. It is almost spread all over the world where there is an issue and these guys are there. And you look at the funding system to the remuneration system to the effective way in which they do the emergency medical care. I am sure there is no other group which does better efficient streamlined medical care like these guys. Now, we have to obey the force you want to command. Uh, so, whoever have said that, my question or uh, my intuition is, so what is the force commanding a healthcare provider like us? I mean, what is that driving us to take us to the next level? And my question is, I only work for one force or that is the command that is for us and that's only the patient. My center of the universe is the patient. If I don't take care of my patient, I will not be in a position to talk anything further. Now. A patient is a very complicated process for me. I mean, the same way my previous speakers was talking about the, 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 the issues that they, they are into. The, for me, the, the whole problem lies in the spectrum of disease. I mean, you know, I have a spectrum of disease starting from infectious disease to, you know, you have your uh, cancers to... Every system has got different diseases and that is again challenging for us to find out what is the effective way in which anything has to be done. And gone are those days where people are looking for inferior care. If you look at anybody for that fact of the matter, whether it's the, any category, the patient wants a personalized solution for him and that has to be an effective thing. So it all boils down to two basic things. I think the whole world is crowded. I mean, healthcare is not something which is not happening anywhere. It's a very crowded market. So how do we conceptualize in a crowded market? And the second thing is to have a sustainability. How do you differentiate among the others? So this is the challenge that we always face. Now, let's talk about how do we conceptualize in a crowded market. Uh, I am headquartered in Abu Dhabi, so I would just talk about what is the challenge that we find in a market like Abu Dhabi. Okay, I've been, uh, I'll just uh, show you these slides. I mean, if you look at the age group in Abu Dhabi, so that's the national and you saw the expatriate. In the expatriate community, 70% of the expats are from India. I'm very proud to say that 70% of the expats are from India. Now, I would also put in a debatable question here saying that, you know, I'm still serving India. 70% of my population in Abu Dhabi is still Indian. So what I normally say is that Abu Dhabi is an American European infrastructure with an Indian mindset. I mean, so there is a lot of expertise of India that happens in Abu Dhabi. So I'll just come back to the slide. Now, um, what happens is, see, there is a traditional model that happens in any provider. It used to be like, you know, you have a hospital, you have a medical center, and you have an emergency care. Now, what happens is, the, just come back to this. Conventionally, what happens in a, 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 a provider setting is that 2% of your total patient volume would only be inpatient care. This was only happening till we entered the market. Now, you look at the setting model, you have 98% of outpatient care. Patient just come to the doctor, just get some medicine, and then he goes home. And 98% and 2% was only inpatient. I mean, you see about a lot of patients and 2% were only getting admitted. But what we have come in and what we have done is 40% of our outpatient consultations need admission. So we went into a model of 40-60. So that is the case mix that is differentiating us from the other providers. I mean, uh, it's been a very successful story for all the providers that have been operating in, in uh, UAE because of the insurance model that they've adapted because they were looking at the, the problems that uh, the US and the UK faced with their, uh, with their insurance policies. And so what they've decided is they decided on a smart move on not 
getting directly involved in the healthcare, but to just to subsidize the insurance and then get a coverage to the entire community, including the nationals and the expats. Now, the only segmentation we want is clinical equity based. I mean, I'm just going to run through a few of the uh, medical words that I think you might be uh, aware of. Uh, in medicine, we have an emergency care, we have a primary care, we have specialized care, and then comes the advanced super specialty care. Now, I think I'm not talking to the wrong crowd. I think you are well aware of what I'm talking on. But the difference is we are a mature insurance-based model. So what are we going to do? I mean, you know, a, 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 a slide which is particularly relevant to India is the secret to change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building something new. Now, I think that's very relevant in a group like you guys, wherein there is a lot of strategy that can be done, and we can take the healthcare delivery system in India to the next level. Now, I don't want to say that we are the only guys who are doing a lot of research and thinking, but let me explain to you what are the difficulties that we face in research and thinking. Now, these are all systems that are there. I mean, uh, you know, this is something, this is the heart, this is the liver, this is the intestines, this is the kidney, this is the stomach, this is the brain. So, every organ has got a lot of things that we need to do and that that again depends on the business or the, the, the new uh, department that has to be created depends on all these things. So what we look at is we look at case volumes, we look at case mix, we look at the disease burden, we look at the clinical pathways, the longevity of treatment, the outcomes, the age group, the paying capacity, the payer, the cost, specialization, equipment, disposables. And after all these things, we need to look at the codes because if you don't code your treatment, you don't get your money. So the procedures, the risk, and the human resource specialization. So there is a long way that is needed to ultimately set up a center of excellence. Now, I just want to give you an example of how do we get into a sort of uh, you know, value chain analysis of a particular service line. So let's take, for example, this was something which I wanted to do back in Abu Dhabi. So I was thinking of a liver transplantation unit. So we looked at the opportunity, we looked at the investment, we looked at the complexity, we looked at the margin and cost to the patient. So if you look at here, I mean, uh, this is the screening, screening thing. This is the investigation. Uh, we do a lot of CT and MRIs. We do a biopsy of the liver. Then we have to do an endoscopy, the drug therapy. And from here onwards, if you look at, the numbers have started declining. It's on a decline. So when it comes to the treatment scenario, the pair has to be well defined. If you don't define the pair, then I think your service line is not going to make you successful and people are not going to stay with you. Uh, so I'm just explaining to you, this is the challenge that we face in, in, in a matured insurance market. So if you implement this in India, I mean, if you ask me about the insurance that is, that is uh, relevant or prevalent in India now, I think it still has got to grow a lot. Now, there is a lot of sequence which is involved from here in terms of scheduling. You know, you schedule a patient, then you have to register a patient, then you need to do a verification of the patient, then you give him the care, you have the charges which are captured. So every services needs your charges to be captured. Then you need to code it. You need to have a discharge or a medication that has to be done. Then you have to put the diagnostic coding, then you have to bill it. Then, if there is anything that needs to be added before you submit to the payer, you have to rebuild it. If there is anything that has to come from the, the doctor or the service provider, you have to go for an appeal. Then you have to submit and you post it on the payments. So this is the long cycle that is happening now in healthcare. It's no longer you see a patient, you give him a medicine, and that ends the service line. So healthcare is now going to take a, a, a big change and this is the system that has to be followed if we have to do uh, healthcare properly in India. Now, I know that there are a lot of ideas. Uh, I mean, you know, people want to talk about uh, a lot of changes that has to happen in healthcare, but we need to channelize them into business units. So, what is the idea? The idea is service based models which will offer a sustainable engagement of people. Now, 
we're talking about centers of excellence. Now, everybody wants to know where do I get the best treatment available if, if for example, in Hyderabad. Let's talk about a specific department called as gastroenterology. So where do I go, where do I get the comprehensive care for if I have a problem with the stomach, where do I get it? So setting up a speciality has got its own cost profile, a brand profile and a risk profile. It is no longer that Dr. X who was doing well is going to sustain for the next 10, 15 years. So it's, 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 it's a commoditized industry. So there are uh, a lot of risk that is involved in it and we need to be very specific on it. So all this depends on the clinical teams, it depends on the clinical protocols, and now everybody wants to go paperless. So we have the electronic medical record, we have the electronic repository systems, we have, the, uh, we have to have a very a good partnership with the pharmaceutical and the, uh, the equipment industries, and now uh, that's not all enough. You need to have a good design, and you need to follow the design standards that has to happen properly to have a good patient flow. Now, these were things that was always allowing for people like us who want to invest in healthcare. So the investment phase is, is used to be one of the most toughest things. So we started by looking into a land. We either built on a land or we built on a land that we buy. Then the next thing that we worried about is the HVAC, the heating, ventilation, and the air condition. The medical gases needs to be done properly because if you don't do a proper medical gas system, you can have patients dying on your hospital and that gives a long, wrong credibility to you. The medical waste management and things that uh, we as a country is lacking on and I think we're going to give a lot of importance for it. Now, gone are those days where you end with a doctor and a pharmacy. Now, you need to get into the real radiological equipments. You need to have 100% fresh air oriented operation theaters because now the post-operative complication rates are on the rise. You need to have very efficient cath labs. Gone are those days where you have to have only cath labs for the heart. Now you've started doing cath labs for your liver. You do angiography for your brain. I mean, what not? I mean, you know, nowadays the surgical incision uh, sizes are going down and you are doing microscopic surgeries and that's going to be the future. So you invest on uh, laboratory equipment and then comes your major thing that is the electronic medical record. What you find in, uh, when you go to an, a hospital in America, the doctor doesn't have time to talk to you. He is just writing the information, he's just typing the information and for him the major worry is that whether the insurance is going to pay him or not. So 80% of the time is taken out to fill in data that qualifies him to I mean, you know, get him paid for the services that he's offering him. So you need to have a picture archiving system. Now somebody goes to a hospital, he wants to see his x-ray on his mobile phone. He would probably ask his uh, family doctor to, you know, get a second opinion on what has to be done. So healthcare is also changing the same way that, I mean, you know, I will talk about a medical doubling knowledge and uh, it's, it's, it's moving more faster than your iPhone revolution. So. Since I'm coming from that line, I wanted to give some importance on the changes that is happening now. And coming to the most difficult aspect, I mean, you know, so I am here, I'm trying to say that, guys, I am working in an extension of India. I'm telling you, Abu Dhabi is an American-European infrastructure with an Indian mindset. I don't know how many of you are going to take it, but this is what I felt and this is why people are joining us. I have two people from ISB who are already with me, so I think it will take some more time for you guys to understand that India is becoming bigger. India is not on a geographical border, India is going to be the universal. So now let me come back to the human capital. It's a very expensive asset. It's in short supply, especially for me where I do super specialized surgeries. The human capital is in short supply and there is a lot of time that is taken for licensing a doctor. I have had instances where I have taken the best of doctor to UAE, but I took time, say about six months, to get him licensed. I mean, so that is one worry that happens. For example, if you look at India, you speak to majority of the doctors here, they don't renew their licenses every year. Whereas you have to renew a car license, you need to renew a, a lot of things, but in India, the system is now catching up wherein, you know, the accreditation processes, attending continuous medical education. So we are also getting better. So this has been an implemented market in that. And my 
worst thing that can happen is the attitude that doctors carry. I'm sorry, I myself, I'm a doctor, so I, 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 I can take that thing. And, you know, this is something which when walk out of your office if you're not treating them well. Now, once you've done that, and it continues, and please don't feel that it is all set. Now it is going to be more complex. Now, once you are running the show, then comes your maintenance, then you come your expansion, then you come of rebuild. Because you, if you don't rebuild a hospital, you don't make a 100% a uh, self-sustainable model in a hospital. That means that you're doing wrong. You have certain departments who are going to do exceptionally well than what you plan. You will have failures in certain departments which you have planned well. So rebuild is always a necessity in a hospital. You have to think about accreditation. Now you're seeing uh, billboards of hospitals which carry JCI accreditation now. I think this has happened in India. This was done first by Apollo hospitals. But later on now, you see a lot of small hospitals getting into the accreditation processes. Because this is what is required. I mean, as my previous speaker was saying about certain pollution uh, qualifications and all that, every hospital needs to go into an accreditation where the policies, the systems, the procedures are tagged to a certain standard. And then you have people who are going to be coming into you to judge and tell you that you need quality services, you need infection control services, so that the managerial expenses coming into all that is making a running of a hospital more complex. Then you need to think about more better ways of disposal management, condemnation systems, and then you have to start marketing certain departments which are not doing well. Now, the other point that I wanted to uh, emphasize was on the human capital training. As you rightly said, I mean, you know, we've started, I mean, let me tell you, talk about Apple. I mean, we are going in from one, two, three, four, five, six now. I don't know where it's going to end. The same applies to doctors like me and people like you. If you don't update your knowledge, you will have an obsolescence. I mean, you are not taken as a serious contender to the market. So skill sets, new techniques are always uh, a challenge. We need to be ahead of the other competitors to get this training onto the doctors. And there is always a problem. One doctor is available for a specific time frame. He timestamps in one hospital for about a few years and then he keeps moving. Gone are those days wherein, you know, like my previous speaker was saying that it is a family oriented thing. So if you are not giving them a proper environment and a policy system to work on, they just move to the next provider. And the other thing is, the other challenges that we face is that if you bring in a new expert into the market, he needs time to settle down. So that is also a, a, a difficulty that we face. Now, this is an interesting slide which I wanted to talk to you about doubling time of medical knowledge. I mean, in 1950, it was about 50 years wherein, you know, you doubled your medical knowledge. In 1980, it was seven years. And in 2010, it was 3.5 years. But guys, I mean, we are in trouble. In 2020, it is projected to be just 0.2 years. So every 73 days, we're going to double our knowledge. I mean, you better be staying on and reading some information because people like you are going to judge us. So we started very small. I said that I was a practicing neurologist and uh, going into a market where we didn't have much of, uh, uh, you know, tactical intelligence and all that. We, what we wanted to do was we wanted to showcase, I mean, you look at the healthcare providers in the entire uh, Middle East, they are all small hospitals to a group of hub and spoke medical clinics. So what we wanted to decide was we wanted to go big. So we took over a building which is about 200,000 square feet. We took 180,000 square feet of pure 17 floors healthcare design and we started it. It was, uh, it was a good journey. Uh, we had our challenges, we had our difficulties. And as you rightly know, the dream always supersedes the dreamer. Now we are three towers together. So in a matter of two years, we have just started seeing about 1,500 patients a day and we are 350 beds. So there's been a lot of uh, consistency and there's been a lot of dedication that had happened to it. And uh, this is what is our story. Now, once you have started and once you've consolidated, then the tide turns slowly where your biggest investment becomes your biggest asset. I mean, the first thing that I've noticed is that we have started getting revenues from the lab. Then slowly the radiology started developing. I mean, then what we could do is once we established in the market, 
we could actually took mar margins from the medic medicine supplies. And finally, the human capital also started kicking in. I mean, what is, uh, what I told you was the settling time of a uh, few particular uh, people. So, the practice environment of the physician started to stabilize. I mean, these people came in, they took their time, three to four months time to settle down, and they started making revenues for us. When you have good people, you attract other good people to come and join us. So we had a program of training the nurses. I mean, the, the train the trainers. So the nurses who had come in six months was immediately uh, recruited as a trainer to train the other nurses. So they were forced to learn and train the rest. And uh, we always gave importance for practice equity. So the practice equity, when it rises, I mean, you tend to be more uh, loyal to what you do. And, uh, you know, in an insurance market, the biggest challenge is that the pair, there is always a delay. So once you stabilize and once you know how, the, how, to, un I mean, how to manage the fund flows, your reimbursement becomes more, more and more consistent. And the final thing is that now we don't need to advertise for jobs. We get about 1,000 CVs a day for employment with us. So things have been good. And now what is that we did for a sustainable model? What did we uh, differentiate ourselves from others? As I rightly said about the, the outpatient strength, we wanted to go in for more beds. That is more rewarding than uh, uh, just doing an outpatient clinic. The only way I know of doing this is I told you, I'm a doctor, I want to do it on evidence-based clinical outcomes and give everybody a tremendous service experience. Uh, guys, I want to talk about this. Every person, every action is a brand touch point. I don't know if I can make this bigger. Uh, if you look at this, uh, this is a patient of mine. He can either go to an outpatient clinic or he can come to the emergency room. Wherever he goes, this is the, the, the lab services that he goes. If there is a delay from the outpatient to the lab, I mean, I make or break. So this is how subtle my relationship with the patient is. From the lab, then he gets referred to a specialist doctor. From the specialist doctor, he either goes to a medical inpatient or a surgical inpatient. From the surgical inpatient, he either goes to a medical super speciality or a medical super speciality. So things for me are getting complicated day by day and every touch point, if I don't realize the pain, and that is a very scary thing that can happen. I told you, every person in my organization can make or break my brand from the most advanced interventional neurologist, a cardiologist or an oncosurgeon to the valet parking guy. So he has the right to make or break me. I'm in the people business. I mean, we had politicians here. We talk about the people business. I have people coming from more than 180 countries. And they come only to make money. And there are a lot of issues related to it. So different races, different caste, different diseases, different geography. So what we do is we have to have our team and everybody to think like me but still I give them creative independence. So this has been a successful model that we were doing. And before I end up my talk, I want you to leave you with this mature thought. The olden days, I'm only talking about a hospital case scenario. We had a captain. I don't want to take names. You would have known people who are running hospitals, who was the captain who used to give them a target to the team saying that, guys, this is what I want you guys to do do this amount of surgeries, do this amount of outpatient clinics, this is your budget, you run the way you want, and that is how it happens. Uh, we've had success models in that, but I think in the present scenario, it doesn't work. So I still feel that, I hope you guys can see this. Yeah. So it has to be on a symphony mode. I mean, you know, everything has to sink in. I told you from the valet parking to the reception guy to the, the person who's gonna draw your blood, I mean, if there is a small mistake in doing a phlebotomy and drawing somebody's blood. So it's a very conscious, coherent approach that we need to do. Uh, this is our dream project. I don't know whether you know this guy. He is one of your uh, ISV colleague. He is with us now. He is the vice president uh, uh, finance. Uh, so 
we've been dreaming big. We are coming up with projects in Qatar, Kuwait. I mean, if you look at my story, there is a lot of regional instability happening uh, outside UAE. Uh, you look at Iraq, you look at, I mean, I don't want to take names. I mean, if you look at the entire region as destabilized. So one of the best options for them is to come to a country where healthcare is subsidized. I mean, you know, you can come to India, you can go to Thailand, but there is where I am. I am with the best of Indian expertise, but I am close to them and I can get the visas and I can get the service lines for them on a better subsidized rates than India. Because I can devise my strategy, I can cut down on service element that can help us in doing this. So we are running towards our new projects. This is one of the most prestigious projects that we are working on. If you look at sports medicine hospital, uh, and especially in tennis, you have a lot of shoulder injuries. And this is really big. I was quite taken by surprise when I was in a place called Rome, uh, where I went in as a tourist. I had, to, I had a chance to meet one of the, the shoulder surgeons uh, whom I did not take it seriously, but when I went into a hospital, I was initially perplexed to see that almost all the tennis players were there inside doing some treatment for shoulders. So gone are those days wherein you know you do bigger projects with a lot of people and now the time is for subspeciality treatment wherein you bring in a team of expertise, you give them a business element, the same thing happens to the patient wherein you subsidize care and look for volumes. Now this project is going to be completed in another uh, two years time so I think I do want to stop my talk and I always uh, want you to Welcome only the best people to Abu Dhabi. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, doctor, for that informative speech. Uh, let's open it up for questions. Yeah. Uh, can someone give him a mic, please? Doctor, you just mentioned that uh, you, you are into movement disorder specialization. Um, so the question I had was, uh, been done here. Mm -hmm. uh, we do very advanced, can, I mean, Parkinsonism treatment in my hospital. We have already done eight deep brain stimulation patients, because mm -hmm. this is somewhat wherein you insert a chip into the brain, right. and this is the the most advanced treatment for Parkinson. So we have already done eight cases. Mm -hmm. I wish that there are no more patients to be recruited, but this is the advancement that Universal has done in treating patients. What is the past percent, or I mean? You are talking That's about the outcomes? Uh -huh. Very good. Very good. You have people who have been exhausted on taking very high amount of uh, dopamine medications. That is, uh, I mean, he can continue with your uh, activities of daily living. Okay. Thank you. These are more advanced cases. These are cases where the medicines are not going to help, and we have got into that. Okay. Gone are those days wherein, you know, you have to uh, die due to respiratory infections and all that. These people are now leading a good quality of life. Thank you. No, I think, see, uh, if you look at my previous speaker also, whatever he had to get in, I mean, sports is something which is, which goes beyond region. I mean, you know, you have heroes from all over the world where there is no, uh, I mean, the, the, the industry grows. I mean, if you look at what we do in Dubai, now, uh, and I already run a sports medicine department here in Abu Dhabi. It was quite successful and we have a lot of football players who come in for treatment. Now, there is a lot of advancement in terms of bone injuries now. You have something like, you have a gum, you have a new chemical which transform itself into a bone. So gone are those days where, you know, you do a major surgery, you take bones out, nail it, I mean, you know, fix it. So there is a lot of advancement happening in orthopedics, especially in shoulder injury. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, you know, nobody has to go to a place like Rome, which is not that popular for doing subspeciality treatment, whereas you have the best advancement in the U.S. or wherever it is. People from the U.S., they come into Rome to do the shoulder correction surgery. So it's all about subspeciality. Now, uh, you have... Uh, viral programs coming every year, you have a new disease, new virus coming in. So it's all about research and development and subspeciality, excellence, that is going to matter. 
Yeah, doctor. Yeah, this is yeah, what's the gist for India market, correct? Yeah, what's the gist for your Indian market and the plan for the rural uh, segment? Okay. Now, I'll tell about the rural market and the urban market. I mean, a lot of people say that, I mean, you know, we're doing better than a few of the players here. Why don't you come to India? Now, I would rather say that I'm not smart enough to enter India. Because if I want to enter to India, I mean, I told you I'm a clinician. For me, money comes second. If I want to come to India, I should be doing surgeries which are not that done in India. The second thing is I need to be really looking at patient waiting times. If you look at the way in which the consultations happen in India, if you want to see a doctor, your one day is entirely gone. You're in the hospital, you see the doctor, the appointments are always late, you go for your lab test, you don't get it on time. So there happens to be a significant loss of time that happens when you go to a, a hospital here. It, it, it cannot be blamed. I mean, you know, uh, it's, it all depends on the attitude. I mean, you know, where to make your services more better. So it will take some time, but India is getting better. So I have one dream to come back to India. I, I mean, everybody has dreams. I wanted to set up a, a cancer center where I want to do proton therapy in India. So I'm just talking about setting up something in Bangalore, which is something which I'll be doing in, 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 in next two years. So cancer is something which I wanted to get involved. And I wanted to set up a, a good sizable research and development because the exposure that we have with the major companies like Siemens. I normally go to Erlangen. I go to the Siemens factory where I get my next equipment done for me. So discuss with them and think about making my equipments a bit more software loaded. I mean, you know, if you take a look for me and my competitor, what happens is if I have a tumor in the brain, I normally sit with the researchers and then look for something extra that I can map to disease uh, to early determine, I mean, early intervene a disease process. So there has to be a lot of R&D done. And this has been a dream project of mine. I've been looking at India on different leagues. So that is, goes with the urban side. The rural side is I have a software. I mean, uh, I've been fortunate enough to buy a software company which is based out of Bangalore. And uh, it's been in the US for the last 10 years. So it's, it's more of an electronic medical record. Now, everybody is techo savvy. Now, you need your reports to be updated. You need your reports to be sent to you. You don't need to go back to the doctor if there is anything not wrong. So I want to get into that sphere. I mean, I'm now my focus is for the next four years is in the Middle East and uh, uh, US. Now, what I do with the software is, uh, for example, now, there is something called as PAX. I mean, PAX is something but seeing your x-ray on your mobile phone. So there has to be a lot of compression. I mean, uh, I don't want to talk about it now because there is a software called DISCO. This is digital information safe copy. So we were very successful in implementing the DISCO software in the US, but not very successful in implementing it in, in India. My partner who has been here for quite some time, he, he is one of the pioneers who established in SGPGI, the Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute. Our software is running in many other hospitals. In especially in the government sector. So this is my commitment to the, the other side. So we want our softwares to be uh, supplied to the other major hospitals. I hope uh, I'm clear because I'm not a big visionary. This is all what I could do. Yeah, uh, actually, I want to compliment you for the excellent slides you have done. Thank you. And uh, secondly, I want to describe you. You are, I think, silently passionate. <laughs> you are so silent and you are so passionate to do the work. Uh, my question is, uh, we have a problem in India. Uh, you know that and you were actually mentioning it. Is about uh, uh, when we go to corporate hospitals, they, they many times write unnecessary tests, unnecessary medicines because they they look at it as a business. Sure. I mean, how much return on patient? Rather than how many patients got cured, how many patients we have fleas. Sure. Now, this is a trust issue actually happening. Fine. Because my mother, I remember two years ago, she got a test done, maybe a week ago, again, she had to go to some clinic. And they said, do tests again. She said, I had done it just a week ago. No, ma'am, again, you have to do it. Sure. Again, it's around three to 5,000 rupees again. So how are you going to address the trust issues when people okay. come to your hospital? Can I? You're done. 
So this has been a question that has been uh, happening since time immemorial. I mean, you know, the trust factor is always very important. I've mentioned to you about the software company that we do. And I don't know whether you've noticed that I was talking to you about the clinical pathways. There are established clinical pathways that happens for every disease process. So for me, I'm not saying that all the doctors that are with me have a good intention. I mean, you cannot, I mean, you're not here to do that. Uh, but when it comes to the insurance model, the clinical pathways becomes very relevant. If you have done a test which is not relevant, it doesn't get paid. Whereas in India, it is still payer defined. I mean, it is individually paid. My payer is defined. I don't need to talk to a patient to do the next test. All what I need to do is I need to take the approval of a particular insurance company which the, the cardholder has. And if the clinical pathway is giving me the go ahead to do that, then only I can do the next test. So this is very relevant and I think uh, the Indian government is seriously thinking of it. As I mentioned to you now, we are installing our new software in uh, the Goa Medical College. So they have also asked for the clinical guidelines. Because as you rightly said, if you look at uh, uh, eye hospital, I had a chance to meet one of the doctors who are working in the, one of the most prestigious eye hospitals in Hyderabad. What they have done is they have started calling in the relatives to the operation theatre but getting a glass barrier in and they do the surgeries live. And they keep explaining to them, this is the level of transparency that we meet in seeing, in, 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 in treating your mother, father, or whoever it is. So there has to be, the trust issue is, has to get better. So I think there are many ways, and it is not going to be easy, but it is going to evolve, and it is going to happen. I think we all need to be very positive on that. The clinical pathways is going to help you on that. And I think, I think we are all smart enough to read about it, to debate about it. And uh, gone are those days wherein, you know, you just listen to the doctor. I hope I've answered your question. Is that it? Thank you, doctor. Uh, I now request the ILS volunteer to hand over the memento to Dr. Shabin Nadikot.